It's always a blessing to listen or to share the Word of God, and uh, this is what I call some glorious verses in Scripture, and uh, as we have seen in the letter of John, the first letter of John, in the first two chapters, John is practically scrutinizing every individual in the church for him to come to terms where he stands with Christ. For him to know what identity he has in Christ, or if he is not, what identity he has when he is not in Christ. Practically, it was an X-ray, an MRI on each individual, and, uh, well, that gave me some work to do at home. I'm sure that even you had some um, things to sort out, maybe to stock take with God. And that is good, that's healthy, that is a sign of progress, a sign of um, uh, us being transformed. Because practically this is our mission, this is our pilg pil pilgrimage here on earth as a church, that we are being transformed into the image of Christ. So, these three scriptures, uh, these three, three verses, sorry, um, John brings to the church then after his two first, his first two chapters, he brings this reality, this truth, a very profound truth. And he felt that he should give this truth that because, and I feel that even this is applicable today, that sometimes Christians forget about their identity, forget about who they are, who we are. And John is bringing us this truth because it was God's great love, it was his initiative that gave us the right to be called children of God. And that is just one sentence that blows my mind. Who, me? I am a child of God. If I am in Christ, I am a child of God. And that has, and that is a package which we are going to discuss today. It was his extravagant pouring of his heavenly grace that brought John to marvel and write down, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. It is amazing to process and to digest such words. I... I it's like, this is a moment for me, when I speak these words, it is a moment of worship. It triggers my heart to worship God in awe. Because everyone knows what's inside him. Did we really deserve this? Did we really deserve this? My answer is no. God forbid if it was yes. But my answer is no. Because it was his gracious love, his initiative, that gave us the right to be called children of God. And that means that we have been born into God's family. And there is no 
human ana analogy on this. You cannot explain it with another example. It's like the closest you can get is that a family, a, a husband and a wife, decides to bring home um, a girl or a boy from, from uh, you know, from a place that they are not being loved, and trying to include them into their family uh, once in a while, but they get so close together that they decide that they want to make legal changes so that they will adopt that son or daughter. But God did not do just this. He did not just adopt us as his sons and daughters, but he gave us a new nature and he activated in us a process to become like Jesus. And no husband and wife can ever do that biologically, but we spiritually have that privilege, amazing privilege that God has lavished on us. I quote John chapter 1 from verse 12 to 13. But to all who have believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Amazing. This is the amazing love that our Father has for us. And John, even here in chapter 1 in his gospel, he started this chapter with this same spirit. He is communicating to the church the gracious identity every believer has that he has the right to be called a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. Brethren, when we were saved, something was activated in us. It's not just salvation. Some Christians just stay there. I am saved and that's all. And that's enough. No, God did much more than that. That's what John's trying to say here. John, um, sorry, God activated in us a process of transformation. So we are being, first of all, initially we have been given a new nature already. But then we are being tuned into becoming like Christ. And that is a process that will, that will take until we take our last breath. But in scripture it says, um, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. It's like this process here, it's, the scripture is, is confirming that this process is progressive. It has not come to an end yet. The moment we see Christ face to face, we will be like him. And that is the climax. That is the climax of us being, being given the right to be called children of God until that day that we will become like Christ. Seeing him face to face. This is amazing. Because children normally, and that is legally also, it is legal also, will inherit their parents' possessions. And we will inherit the kingdom of God. 
Can you process this for me? In your heart, we will inherit all that Christ possesses. This is our identity. And John is pouring this truth, this amazing truth on the church. Because even though there were false teachers all around us back then and now, he is giving us this assurance, this sure position, this identity that we are in Christ and no one will move us. He wants to instill this, he, he wants to empower the members of the church who are truly in Christ, and it's important that I say who are truly in Christ, because there is, he is making um, um, a diversity here. He is, he is making a difference between those who are the children of light and those who are the children of darkness. That is a truth. It causes pain in our hearts to know that there might be people in the church who are around the church who are not yet there. And it's important for us to examine ourselves and not to be so sure. Because when we are sure, it means that we are not humble anymore. So it's always, we have to always keep this position. I know that I am in Christ, but I know that I need to continue to change my life. I know that I am still subject to God transforming me. So it's not like I know that I am in Christ, full stop. I know that I am in Christ, but I am not ready yet. Aren't we all like that? I hope so. We will inherit the kingdom of God. So whatever, scripture says, everything in God's kingdom belongs to us. Can we get the worship team up here? No, I, I was just joking. <laughs> I was just joking. Bec I know. It's like I said that because isn't this a time to worship God? Look. See how very much our Father loves us. And if you explore those few words and deepen what John is trying to say, phew, it's mind-blowing. Spiritually, not literally. But that's why I said, can we get the worship team up here? And I thank God for you, brother. You really, uh, in season, out of season, I'm out to worship God. Yes, but that is an attitude that I am sure is sort of rising up in your heart that this is a reason, another, may I correct myself, another reason for me to worship God. Because everything, and I say everything, that is in the kingdom of God belongs to us. And I quote, And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And brethren, his suffering there, in brackets, is temporary. 
but his glory is eternal. His suffering, and this is what we are going through as pilgrims. This is what we're going through in this world. We are suffering not as much as other countries, but I mean, you know, guns are being turned onto us now. It's like we are um, a, sect, a section of society that everyone wants to bring us down. It's not like they mock you, but they want to cut you out of the, the picture, rub you out of the map. You're crazy. I met this friend of mine who, who knows me when I was still in the world. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's a long story. And I, he, he came to me and he was talking to me in a, in a language that he thought that I was still compatible with. And I, I waited to, for him to, to, to stop and I said, hey, listen, my friend, I'm not like that anymore. He said, what? He said, I said, I, I, I got to know the gospel. I got to know Christ. And I dedicate myself and my life to share the gospel with my friends. And that's what I want to do with you. And he said, you're crazy. And he walked away. Uh, a great friend of mine. An old friend of mine. But yes, it says here. But we do, where is it? But people, but the people who belong to this world don't recognize, don't recognize that we are God's children because they do not know him. Do you remember that time that we, do not, we did not recognize because we did not belong to him. And yes, that's why we, 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 we are faced with people who call us crazy and say, because they are not seeing this yet. And it has to be the Holy Spirit to give them that, that sight, that revelation, as we needed the Holy Spirit to give us that revelation. Another thing in, in, this, in these three verses is that we have limited knowledge or limited revelation of what will happen. And it says, Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will, we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. So that point in time where we meet Christ face to face is not yet revealed to us. We know that it will happen. We know that we will become like him. But that's all you know. Just the title of the subject, but we do not know that revelation. But the important thing that is what that we know that it will happen. We do not know how, just as we do not know when Jesus will return. But we know that he will return. We know how to read the season when he is very close to returning, but we do not know the day. We do not have that revelation. In fact, in Corinthians 3, 18, we, I quote, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Can you just try to picture you 
being changed into the glorious image of Christ. There is a reason, I, in my opinion, there is a reason for this lack of revelation. May I use the word lack, but it's not correct. Because in verse 3, John continues to write and says, All who have this eager expectation, listen to the words, will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. So that means that there is a departure. So there is a progression. And scripture says that because this hope activates in us, this eager expectation activates in us to live a pure and holy life as he is pure and holy. So you understand me saying lack of revelation? There is a missing revelation, but it's for our own good to keep us reaching out. Because our hope, our hope to become in the glorious image of Christ keeps us alive in the church. And it is very easy for you to identify if you belong to Christ or not. Fair? That is what's, what John is doing here. When I was um, assisting my brother last Tuesday... And we were sharing what's, what happens when, we, when you study the word of God. And I told him, it's like when I experience the word of God, when I explore it, I would love to sort of bring out to you exactly what I'm feeling. And I don't always manage, but the Holy Spirit will, will, will uh, compensate for that, I'm sure. But I told him, I felt like I was sitting on a desk next to John. When he was writing these words, it's amazing. Scripture is amazing. And I think you can understand by my body language that where my heart stands on this. It's like these words they hit us in the heart. And this is, is it's very important to, listen, to, to, to know and remember and listen to this truth, brethren. It's like, I know this. And even I knew it. But now I know it more. And tomorrow, God wants me to know it more and more. Because this is the process of transformation. The word of God gives us the momentum, as to say, for us to be transformed into the glorious image of Christ. And on that glorious day, when we see him face to face, we will become like him. Glory to God. Glory to God. When we contemplate on these verses, it makes us think, how should I live? How should I dedicate my life? How can I reciprocate on what, on the, fa the Father's love that is written here? How can I reciprocate? I have to live a pure and holy life. Is that, is that easy? Oh, brethren, no, it is not. It is not. We are our greatest enemies. And that is why in the spiritual battle we have to renew our minds with scripture. And this is part of it. Here today all of us, even I, who, am, who, 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 are, who is 
delivering this word, we are being renewed, we are being purified with the word of God. That is why it is called the word of life. So, it's important, um, how am I in, in time? Wrong? I, I'm, I'm done? All right. So it's important to, to all right, so it always happens because I, I always prepare a sermon of two hours. I'm sorry. So it's important to keep in mind that we are not just saved, but we are adopted. And we are co-heirs with Christ of everything that is in Scripture. So if I may cut, um, remember, the sermon continues on Tuesday. Okay? That is why we are tight in time. Because we have another hour. So it is very important to keep this in mind. Tuesday is not optional. Tuesday is the continuation of the sermon. Okay? So it's important for me to communicate this because I believe that sometimes we'll have, we, we need to hear. So we owe our position as his sons and daughters to our Father's gracious love. We just sang that. That purchased our salvation with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We owe our position to no one but to Him, our glorious Father. So our identity, because that's, that's why they do not recognize us, our identity is hidden in Christ. And I, I quote Colossians 3, For you died to His life, and your real life is hidden with Christ. Colossians 3.3. 3. We are hidden. Our life is hidden. Not because we, cannot, we, we are not called to show God's love. But the gospel is hidden because we have gi been given the right to be called children of God. And unbelievers have not been given this right. So they cannot understand this language, this new family language. So that, I mean, at first I used to feel a bit disappointed when I came across people who cannot understand the gospel. But now <laughs> I, I can understand more. So, brethren, for me, to, for me to conclude, we have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know. We have to always remember our position. We are in the family of God. We are God's children. Let us rejoice in that. Let us show it. Live according to the riches that we have received. Remembering. And I close with this. First, our purpose in this life is to honor and glorify God. Our goal is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to magnify God and to, show, to share his saving grace of Jesus Christ. Our destiny is settled. Our life is eternal and one day we will be in the presence of Jesus Christ forevermore. So let us not forget our position, our identity, who we are. In Christ. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord God, for your gracious love. I thank you, the love that you showed for us, Lord God. It's, it needs, we need more than we have in our head to understand, Father, the love that you have shown for us. You have given us the right to be called your children, and I praise you and I worship you for this, Lord God, and I ask you, Lord God, that this marvelous truth reaches into our heart and continues to change us, to become like your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.